Not seeing it. Not seeing it, right? Jersey's probably no. Really strong. No. Yeah. And plus, you know, the alternative of calling your lender and just telling them that you 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 have a hardship and you'd yeah. rather pay the interest rates instead of the mortgage. And mm -hmm. that's another way to do yeah. it. You guys aren't seeing it much yet. It's still very early, but um, I looked at the statistics and um, foreclosures are up 57% this year from last year. So they're definitely on, on the rise. Uh, we don't know if it'll ever get to be as bad as it was in uh, 2008 to 2010 or 11. But if they do, and if we do come across one and you know this is a new year, we have no idea what's waiting for us, at least we'll be better prepared and we'll be able yes. to service those people better, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really yeah. excited for your course. Oh, great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, uh, th thank you for signing up. You were, uh, I think you were definitely the first one that, uh, yes. that signed up yours. As was, soon as I got the notification on my email, I was like, <laughs> I have to. Yeah. I knew you were going to jump all over that though. So thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to let you down for sure. That's going to be a really good one. You um, never did. No, not at all. <laughs> I, I like to over deliver for sure. All right. So let's cover some of the stuff that I want to show you guys today. And we'll cover with, um, uh, I want to start with, first of all, I want to start with what you need in order to get a short sale done. All right. So let me just share my screen with you guys and you can see what I'm, you guys can follow along. And by the way, this is recorded. So if uh, you guys want to watch this later, it'll be on Culture University's uh, YouTube page. All right. Okay. So let's start with a checklist and I'll give you guys a link to all these documents uh, in, in the chat. Okay. So let's start with the checklist. The checklist would look something like this. In order for you to conduct a short sale, you need the it's kind of like applying for a mortgage in reverse, because if anyone here has any experience with what a mortgage application looks like, the lender is going to ask the client for two years tax returns for bank statements. They're going to ask them for, uh, you know, all, all these things in order to qualify for the mortgage. So basically what you're going to be doing here is you're going to be what um, you're going to be trying to reverse qualify them. So what reverse qualification means is basically showing the bank that they don't meet the requirements anymore that they can't afford it anymore and now just because your client makes a lot of money doesn't mean that the bank won't approve them for a short sale i had attorneys that i've done short sales for who make six figures and i've been able to do short sales for them just because their obligations their expenses every month are right in line with what they're making so add another uh, mortgage payment on top of that and they can't catch up especially when you add in all the arrearages all right so the first thing you're going to ask them for is their two years tax returns then you're going to ask them for 30 days of their pay stubs. And when you do ask them for these things, prepare them. Let them know, hey, either it's the end of the year and we may be asking you for next year's tax return when it's ready because we might still be in the process of, of negotiating this. Because what people, what happens with a lot of these people is that they get frustrated and they're like, oh, the bank is asking us for so many documents. So what I like to do is set the stage early on in the very beginning when I, when I take a short sale and say, look, this is what I need initially, but the bank may ask you for updated documents along the way. So don't be surprised if they ask you for, <clears throat> if they ask you for more pay stubs, if they ask you for more bank statements, if they ask you for additional bank statements, because let's just say that in their main bank account, they have all these transfers going from their bank account to another bank account. When the um, underwriter sees that, they're going to say, well, it looks like they're funneling money to another account. I need to see that account too, because they got to make sure they don't have a hundred grand stashed away in another bank account, trying to get over on the bank. You know, they're not, the bank's not going to take a loss just because they're good Samaritans. They're going to take a loss if it needs to happen. Okay. So when you take a, a short sale and you ask for these documents, you have to kind of pre underwrite it yourself. So once you've got the two years tax returns, you've got the 30 days pay stubs, you got the two months of um, bank statements. Now you can look at the picture and you can start to see, uh, you can start to see for yourself. OK, well, they make one hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, that's what they report. Right. So how much is that? You take a calculator, you divide it by 12 and you're like eight thousand eight hundred dollars a month. That's what they make. OK, so then you fill out the application with them, which every bank has what's called an RMA which stands for request for mortgage assistance in that RMA, you're going to fill out with them their monthly expenses. Now, some monthly expenses can be verified because uh, it pops up on their credit report, but some monthly obligations are not. So for instance, groceries, they don't show up on your, on your credit report, you know, your, um, how much you spend on electric on your gas or on whatever even utilities on dry cleaning on tolls, just the things that you need to live entertainment, you know, clothing, all these things that you're filling out, 
once you add everything up, what you got to look at is, can these people really afford this home? If there's a big margin there that allows them to still comfortably afford that home, chances are they're not going to approve that short sale. Okay. So you also have to look at their bank statements. You go looking through their bank statements. It's like, do these people have 50 grand in the bank? Because if they do, the bank's going to ask them to participate and bring some money to closing. But if they got three to 5K in their bank account and they've got $7,000 a month in expenses, then there's probably not going to be any need for them to participate in, in bringing any, any shortage to the closing. And when you're looking at those bank statements, look to see if there's anything that looks fishy to you. Anything that may pop up as a question later on, such as transfers from or to another bank account, mm -hmm. or maybe they've got child support coming in, or maybe they got child support going out, or maybe they've got uh, lump sums being deposited in their bank account every month that's not from their employer. Like, where is this coming from? You know, so you got to really kind of look at it <clears throat> as the underwriter before you send them off, because the last thing you want to do is send out bank statements that are just going to blow up. You know, so if that's the case, you may need to you, you may need to tell your client. Hey, listen, these bank statements look horrible. I need explanations for these things before we submit it to the bank. Or you're just going to have to wait a few months and clean these bank statements up. And then we can resubmit for a short sell. Because if not, it, it, the chances may be very limited to none. They don't get those approved. Okay. We also need the mortgage statement. The mortgage statement is very important because a lot of people forget to ask for this. And you're going to need the bank that they uh, have. A lot of people don't even know what bank they pay their mortgage to because sometimes Either it's been sold in the process and they don't even know who they're supposed to be paying to. And they definitely don't know their loan number. And you need both of those things. And also another thing you need from the bank statement is um, the, the mortgage statement is you need to know what kind of a program did they have? Maybe, was it conventional? Was it FHA? And people don't know half the time what kind of loan program they had. You know, you may, you may, tr you may be able to decipher it by asking them some types of questions like, hey, how much of a down payment did you put? You know, does, does PMI ring a bell? Like, but it's easier to just get the mortgage statement so you can get all the information you need right from there. Additionally, you're going to need them to sign what's called the authorization form. The authorization form gives, gives the bank the, gives them the right to speak to you or to your short sale processor or to whoever you're going to delegate to do the short sale for you. That document, if you don't get it signed, it's pretty much pointless because you can't do anything with their paperwork. You can submit it, but then you can't call in to follow up. And it takes about 48 hours, sometimes longer, for that uh, document to be registered in their system. So if you send it in today and you call later on today or tomorrow, they probably still going, oh, we're still waiting for it to clear. So it takes a few days. So what we like to do is we like to submit our um, authorization form ahead of time before we even collect the documents. So before we even have the documents in hand, because maybe they're still gathering them up, we have them sign that so we can submit it early on to the bank and get it and get our authorization already in there. Uh, next is the 4506T, right? That's a mouthful. A 4506T is, um, is, is a document that gives the, the bank, gives them the right to verify that the bank statement, I'm sorry, that the tax returns we're submitting to them are the same tax returns that you submitted to uh, the IRS. So it basically allows them to get a transcript of your of their tax returns to make sure that you're not giving them one set of fake tax returns and you're submitting different tax returns to the IRS. Right? People, believe it or not, people do that. Not maybe not so often or so common or anything like that anymore. But there was a there was a time in which people used to make fake uh, fake uh, what's that returns, believe it or not. It's not not a not a pretty thing to do and you can get a lot of trouble. Um, let's see. Next is the RMA request for mortgage assistance. We spoke about that. So that it, it's it's pretty intensive. The RMA, the request for mortgage assistance, depending which bank you have, they may have different ones. But the standard Fannie Mae ones, they're roughly about eight pages. Now, once you've done a few of these, and I'll pull one up and I'll send and I'll show you guys in a bit. But once you've completed these on your own and you've done it a few times, you get to kind of understand what do I really need them for? What do you need the client for? Because there's only a few questions in there that you can't answer from the documents they, they gave you. So I've, I've done it so many times that I know that I have to ask them for the day of birth because that's not on any of their documents. I have to ask them for the reason why they fell behind because that's not on their documents. So there's a few things that you have to go through with them and ask them because without their input, you are not going to be able to fill that out correctly. The most important thing on the RMA that you need them for is for their monthly obligations, the, the expenses that they carry every month. Once you're able to fill those few things out with them, 
The rest you can do on your own from the documents that they've given you. So you can take a process that's very uncomfortable and could take you an hour to fill out with someone else. You can, you, you can literally do that in like five minutes by just covering the important things with them on the RMA, filling out the rest of the RMA yourself with the information they've given you, and then sending the RMA to them for them to review and then sign off on it if it looks correct to them, right? So that's a, that's a little hack that, I, that I've learned over the years, because imagine sitting with someone and going through eight pages of Q&A when you can answer these questions from the documents they've already given you. It makes you a little bit more streamlined. It allows you to do more with your day. So take my advice. If you ever um, do any of these and make sure that you do the RMA, uh, only, only the questions that you can't answer without them with them, and then the rest you do on your own. It'll, it'll save you guys so much time. A utility bill. A utility bill is very important because if the person lives in the house and they're asking for the bank to assist them with moving expenses, because believe it or not, the bank actually gives people money to do a short sale. I've seen anywhere between $1,000 to, <clears throat> I've seen people get <clears throat> through lotteries that they used to do, thirty dollars to $40,000 to move out of their house. Now, we've always, we always used to aim, and most of the time we would be successful in getting uh, owner-occupants to receive a $10,000 uh, credit from the, from the bank. So the seller is walking away with no money. But the bank is giving them 10K for moving expenses. Believe it or not, we would always request it. And most of the time we would get them approved. So why you need the utility bill is because you're trying to prove that the person lives in the house. So the, the way that the banks usually want confirmation that they live there is with a utility bill, not water, because water can, you know, the, the water can be in your name and you can live somewhere else. But usually they want to see something like a gas bill, electric bill, cable mm -hmm. bill, cell phone bill, you know, though. They'll ask for those if um, they don't They don't believe that the person lives there. Most of the time, they're going to request it regardless. So that's why we always collect that ahead of time. The more you can collect in the beginning, the better, because you'll be better prepared. And then um, number nine is a hardship letter. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with a hardship letter, what um, it entails. But a hardship letter is very, very simple. And it doesn't have to be over. It, has to, it doesn't have to be over exaggerated. So some people think that a hardship letter should be like their whole life story, a couple pages long. If you're an underwriter and you're underwriting tens, if not a hundred files a day, would you really want to read a, you know, that much of someone's, you know, sob story? We try to keep it to one paragraph. We try to make it really concise and we try to nail a couple points. We want to nail when the problem began. We want to nail uh, what, what, what happened. And we want to also cover the fact that we cannot recover. If we can say those three things in the, in the paragraph, then that's really all the underwriter cares about. So for instance, in 2008, I lost my job due to the financial crisis. I haven't been able to find employment since then. And because of that, I fell behind my mortgage payments and I haven't been able to catch up. At this point, I'm so far behind on my mortgage that I don't think it'll be possible for me to ever catch up. Please consider my house for a short sale process. I'll be forever grateful. If you have any more further questions, please contact me at blah, blah, blah. That's all it has to be. Yeah, that's all it has to be. It doesn't have to be like, you know, it was our dream to own a house. And then we finally found the perfect one on one, two, three, round three. <laughs> My kids fell in love with it. You know, like it doesn't have to be all that, you know. Yeah. And in the beginning, I had no idea when I first started working in short sales and in the beginning of the housing crisis, we had no idea. And like, there were no examples of hardship letters on Google. You know, there was none of that. We just, there was this website called Short Sale Superstars. That it was like a forum for people who did short sales. And people used to share ideas in there and uh, share examples. And we, we would jump in there from time to time and get some ideas. And we noticed that a lot of people were keeping these uh, hardship letters to like half a page or less. And we even got some people in there who used to say like, oh, handwritten is better. And we've tried both handwritten, typed. I don't think it matters. I think the point is, remember, put yourself in the position of an underwriter. You don't want. I would always... want it typed if I was an underwriter because yeah. people hand writing sucks. I was about to say that because if you're an underwriter and you're reading a ton of these a day, you can't read everyone's handwriting all the time. So type mm -hmm. is better, exactly. And but what you really do need is you need an original uh, signature on the hardship letter. So have them sign the hardship letter. So when you go to meet with them, or if you're going to do everything virtually, make sure that they sign that hardship letter, um, either with your e-signature software. I think by now. Everybody accepts that, but there was a point. There was a point in time in which banks would not accept your e-signature stuff. So, 
I still, just to be safe, if I'm going to be meeting with them, I get them to sign all these things in person, just to be careful because some some banks mm -hmm. just don't like e signature for some reason. Okay. All right. Um, that's pretty much it as far as what you have to collect. We're going to go through what the process looks like in just one second. But before we do that, anyone have any questions here? Am I missing anything, or is there anything you want me to uh, cover again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just was going to ask you, um, how long does the whole process take? Because, you know, when people hear short sale, they're like, oh, my gosh, this is this will be quick. Mm -hmm. But, you know, <laughs> you should call them long sales. In the very beginning, yeah. when I first started doing mm -hmm. short sales, they used to take forever, yeah, literally forever. Uh, and there was such a backlog back in 2008, they would take so long. Now the backlog is the backlog is gone. And depending which bank you're working with, some are more seasoned and capable of doing a short sale than others. So I've gotten short sales approved in a month. Uh, is Joelle on the call? Joelle's here. Joelle, when I first met Joelle, she actually was hired to be one of our short sale processors in, um, in um, a small startup real estate company that I, that I had back in 2010. And <clears throat> what's it, 2010? 2015, 2015. And um, she, when she first came on, her first short sale, she got it approved in like 45 days. And she was like, she just thought it was normal because it was her first short sale. She's like, yeah, I got this one approved. I'm, and me and my partner are looking at each other like, what? Like, you got a short sale approved <laughs> in 45 days? Like, we're ready to close. So yeah, like, and, and needless to say, like, we we're very happy. And, you know, we, uh, we, we bought that property and we sold that in like three months. We did really well with it. And, but short sales, I've, I've, I've had short sales that have taken two years. And I've had short sales that have taken, you know, that long. So it could be anything in between, but the process have got, has gotten a lot better with banks now. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, if you have all your ducks in a row, you can get a short sale approved fairly quickly, I would say under three months, you know, and that's pretty quick in the, in a short sale world. Weeks, two weeks ago, Lewis, I sat with um, Dan at Razum and did a certification to be certified as a short sale um, agent. Yes. And the instructor mm -hmm. said, um, if you are short on detail capability and short on patience, you probably should look somewhere else other than short sales because yeah. you should figure on a minimum of 180 to 200 days on the average short sale closing mm -hmm. so that's from the instructor standpoint of 40 years experience yeah. but i'm not refuting what you're saying but that's just an answer to john's question yeah it could take it could take long it depends which bank because i remember having a short sale with mnt mnt bank and um they're very unconventional. Like they were, they were really, 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 really bad. They were horrible. I had a, I had a lady who was a judge for the city of Newark, and uh, she had this beautiful historical home in, um, in Forest Hills in Newark. It's like the very, very beautiful part of of Newark. And um, her son died, and she went through this hardship, you know, with medical bills and burying him, and and it was just a really, really bad situation. And I said, you know what? Walk in a park. She's going to get a short sale approved because she can no longer afford this monstrosity of a house. She's um, still working as a public servant and she lost her son. I was like, this is, this is a walk in a park. Can you believe that M&T Bank not only denied her, but they were asking her for death records. There were, it, it was so, it was such a bad situation that I had to apologize to her. I said, look, I've never, ever, ever been through something like this so bad. She even got on the phone with them personally and, you know, had bouts with them. But just because your client fits the bill doesn't mean the bank is going to say, okay. And they, they prefer, they, um, they, they preferred to take that house to foreclosure. You know, I tried so hard to, to stop the process, but uh, eventually they just, they just wouldn't give. So, you know, it's unfortunate. Some banks just won't, won't look at the situation, but most banks will, most banks will. I would say that out of 100 short sales that we did, probably 90 to 95 percent of them would get approved, and a very small percentage of them would not get approved either because they were too far along, and the bank took them to foreclosure, or the banks just said, "You know what? We just don't feel like this person deserves a short sale." So it, it's everything in between. A couple other things she said, Lewis, uh, reiterating what you highlighted. Yeah. Lots and lots of paper and utility bills. The tax form. She said, "Get ready to download multiple times." because they're going to repeat. So what you emphasize, she did also. Yeah. And she also, um, just as an FYI to, to the rest on the team here, that she said, um, 
many banks will not work with you unless you have a certification. So if you're looking for maybe something for uh, licensing credits, maybe that's a good one to get, get because if you're going to go into short sales, some banks just won't consider you because a lot of people are competing with us for yeah. the business. So they're going to choose someone that's that's certified. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Lewis, I have a question. Yes. Uh, who pays the commission? Oh, that's a good question. So the bank pays the commission and um, they're no longer allowed to negotiate with you and they have to pay you the 6%. There was a point in time in which banks used to try to cut us down to 4%, 5%. And if you represent your own client, so for instance, if you represent the seller and the buyer, they used to try to they used to try to really beat you up on commission. But at one point, that all changed, and banks weren't allowed to negotiate with you anymore. So we still, to this day, if we have a dual agency, we still to this day uh, try to put the name of um, of another agent as the buyer's agent, because um, if we don't, uh, we, uh, we're just in the habit that like when we had the same listing agent and buyer's agent they would try to cut us down on the commission. So the way we would combat that is by saying that it's, um, even though it's a dual agent, it's two different separate agents that are working on this file. And then they would stick to the 6% commission. But I think nowadays they don't, they don't bother with that anymore. They, they just let the 6% go, go by, but I may be, I may be wrong in, in saying that because we've always stuck to keeping it separate. Yeah. Thank you. No, no problem. Good question. Oh, and some agents charge 7%. John Lewis charges the bank seven and he gets it. Nice. Not. Yeah, I mean, you may not always get it, but he tries. He goes for it. And he gets it sometimes. So. The answer yeah. is never a no till you hear a no. Exactly, exactly. So he puts in 7%. I don't know if maybe it flies under the radar. The underwriter doesn't spot it or whatever the case. Or maybe she's just used to everybody just charging 6 and she didn't see the 7. But he's gotten it. He's gotten it. And uh, we're, 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 we're witnesses of that. So it's happened. All right. So let's move along now to the, um, the process of the short sale. Let's see Okay, here's the workflow. This is what you guys are probably going to really, 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 really want to focus on is the process. I'm going to, can you guys see or should I make it a little bigger? Is that okay? Okay. All right, start with this. All right, let's prepare a motivated seller. And the key word there is motivated because we've gotten people who are in a position to do short sales who were not motivated, who wasted our time, right? Uh, why would they do that? Because they just want to stay in the house as long as they possibly can. And when they don't see the end in sight, some people are just opportunistic and they will just drag their feet. Now, I'm not saying it's not good to take those people on as clients, but you need to make sure that they're motivated to sell when it gets approved. Because some people think that, oh, I'll start working with you as a short sale. It's going to take a year. I'll be here for another year. And then whatever, you know, some cases and some states that are judicial, they take that long. And some states that are not judicial, they don't take that long. So if um, I'm taking a short sale with someone, I'm asking them a couple of questions to, to qualify them. I'm asking them, so what are your plans after the short sale? Do you have a place to go? Uh, what if we got the short sale approved in 60 days? Is, is that a good timeline for you, 90 days? Because when we get the approval letter, after we get the approval letter from the bank, they're only going to give us about 30 to 45 days to close. Would you be able to be out in time? If they say yes, like oh, we got a place to go with no problem. I don't care if I got to stay at an Airbnb or I got to get a rental apartment for, for a little while. I'll do it. If that's what, they're, if that's what they say when you ask them those questions, then you know they're motivated. If you ask them those questions and they're like, kind of like, uh, we're kind of hoping that it would take a little longer. And, you know, I'm like, oh, so what do you have in mind? You know, you kind of have to ask those uncomfortable questions because if you don't, then you're wasting your time and you're wasting the other people's time too. The buyers, the buyers could be highly motivated and they're like, okay, we got the short sale approved. We're ready to go in 30 days. Then you have, then you get in and start having to ask for extensions. And if you ask for too many extensions, they may just just kill the, the file and say, no, you got to start all over again. It, it, it can get pretty ugly. So we don't want to yes. do that. And um, what if they're in a dire situation, but they don't have the money to move out? Like I said, the banks give them moving assistance a lot of times. Yeah. So we don't promise that, but we tell them that we're aiming for that. So for instance, okay. I never I never promise to someone. Oh, you're going to walk out with ten thousand uh, dollars guaranteed because if that's the case, then you're violating. Um, you're you're making it. You you're you're trying to cash a check that doesn't exist. Basically, you can be okay. in trouble and you could be held uh, liable for that. So if you ever get in a position where you feel like you might be compromised because mm -hmm. the seller said to you, um, you know, I'm only doing this short sale because you know I, I heard that you can get ten thousand uh, dollars from moving out. I would say to that person, 
there's a good possibility that the bank would give you that, but that's never guaranteed. And then after I have that meeting, I would follow that up with an email saying, just to reiterate our conversation, um, you specified you needed $10,000 in moving assistance uh, for you to be able to get out of your home and into a new home. But I just want to reiterate that it's not guaranteed and we're going to do our best to try to get you that. But in the event that the bank does not give you $10,000, I want you to please have a plan B. You know, So follow that up with an email because what you don't want is then later on for that person to say, oh, I'm calling the commission because you promised me $10,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not something you're, you're positioning. Yeah, you know. Lewis, I have a question. Yeah, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna take you back. Is that okay? Go for it. No, no, no. We have time. Where was it? Like nine thirty? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, like let's say the house um is uh, worth four hundred thousand, right yeah. today, <clears throat> and the people owe on it three hundred thousand. Yeah. So the bank decides how much they want to, they're going to sell the house for? No, you can only ask the bank for permission to do a short sale if you're underwater, which means you owe more on your mortgage than what the house is worth. So if you have a client that is a, the opposite, who, whose house is worth 300000 but they owe 400000 then <gasps> you can go in for a short sale. Got it. Is mm -hmm. there any kind of appraiser uh, mm -hmm. done yeah, we're going to get into that process right here with the okay. uh, workflow and you'll be able to figure it out. Uh, Janet has a question. Janet's a, a friend of mine who's visiting us today. Janet is uh, from Texas. She's from the Austin area. She's with EXP and uh, she wanted to jump in today. She has a question and says, how are you preparing for short sales behind on payments and bank has started their process, but owners still have equity in their home? Uh, yeah, so if people are, if people are um, getting foreclosed on, and they still have equity in their home, then that wouldn't constitute as a short sale. That would just constitute as like a fire sale. Like, hey, listen, we got to make a move right now. <laughs> like we got to start selling your home before it's too late. But if they get foreclosed on, this is what I would say to a seller in that position. If you get foreclosed on and your home goes to trustee sale, foreclosure sale, or sheriff sale, whatever it's called in that state, I would say to them, look, there is this law that protects you. That basically means that if there's a surplus, if your home sells at a foreclosure auction, for 400,000 and you only owed 300,000, then you're gonna collect the difference, which is 100,000. The, the court will still give you that money, but you gotta apply for it. You gotta apply for your surplus, right? Some people don't even know how the process goes and don't even, don't even know it exists, right? But do you really think that the home is selling for top dollar at a sheriff sale? Probably not. So instead of allowing that to happen, let's get the house sold right now so we can get you top dollar and then we can pay off this bank and all their back fees that they're owed. And then you can walk, walk out of the situation with more money, with your dignity, and at the same time, without their timeline, with your timeline. You can get the bank to adjourn their share of sale or foreclosure sale if you've got a contract in place and you've got a, a deadline in place. Because the last thing the bank wants to do is pay more attorney fees possibly take the property back on their books. They don't want to do that. So you could, if you're down to the wire, a lot of times banks will give you a little bit of a time, a little adjournment, a little breathing room. If you've got something that's ready to close and you're promising them all of their money back. Okay. And sometimes you may have to show them a HUD one, a closing disclosure uh, to show them what they're going to be netting in order for them to approve that extension. Right. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. That's something different. Uh, Jen, I hope I answered your question there. Oh yeah. It works great. Thanks very much. No problem. You are. All right, so here we go. Um, number one, the prepare motivated seller. So we've got that right. Get the uh, in the initial meeting. This will allow you. This will allow you to show your knowledge on the matter. Where did I go? On the matter and save you trips. Okay, there we go. And save you multiple trips. Okay, yeah. So make sure you prepare yourself correctly in the first meeting. At the first meeting, I'm I'm showing up there at the first meeting. I'm showing up there expecting to collect documents, right? But you can't hit somebody with, hey, where are all your documents when you get there? <clears throat> what I like to do ahead of time is if I'm going to go there in person, I want to have them prepared. I say, listen, when I get there, uh, we're going to talk about doing a short sale. So the process goes like this. Unless I didn't know it was a short sale, but if I know I'm going into a short sale, I tell the, the people, uh, when I get there, please make sure to have the following documents ready so we can make this uh, as easy as possible for you. And then I give them that list that I just sh shared with you, okay? So that way, when you go to that initial meeting, you've already got all that stuff ready, right? And you, and you don't want originals. I don't I mean, unless, unless you have no other choice. 
even if I get originals nowadays, like phones are so good, you can probably take a lot of good quality pictures of them. But the last thing you want to do is take their original tax returns and then lose them. <laughs> That's not a good day, right? And you don't want to try to get copies before you show up for, for them to get you copies if you can. Okay, next, uh, assess the home's value. So how do you know you've got a short sale on your hands? Well, you got to do a little comp analysis. So look for comps in the MLS uh, walkthrough on the home because the home may, on paper, from a comp search may look like it's a $400,000 home. But when you walk through the house, maybe it's a pigsty, maybe it's dilapidated, maybe it's like falling apart, who knows, right? Maybe it's a boarding house, who knows? They, they probably, you know, you don't know these things until you walk through the house. A lot of things could look deceiving from the outside or from old pictures. So not only do a comp search, but walk the house and ask about repairs and take pictures of all the damages. Because sometimes homes are photographed pretty well until you start to get into the nitty gritty and you find the mold growing in the corner of that one room or in the basement and, you know, states that have basements or the roof might be completely like torn off on the one side that you can't see from the street. So you want to take pictures of all these things because later on it may help you in a dispute in case the bank wants too much. All right, number four says, um, analyze the seller's needs and motivation. So find out the entire story and the hardship. Ask if they, if they have a timeline. Remember, we spoke about that. Ask what is more most important for them in their situation. Measure their willingness. Uh, measure their willingness from one to ten. Right? That's what we would talk about is making sure that they're really, really ready to do this process because it's embarrassing to start a short sale process, getting up and getting a lot of people um, hyped up, and then the deal doesn't close. That's not a good deal, day for anyone. <laughs> Okay, uh, Janet says, is it worth always giving them a budget plan for how the 10,000 will be used? Um, the I don't know about giving them a budget plan because the, the banks don't care what you do with your 10K. Like they give it to you, they make it out to you, they, they, they send you a, a check made out to your name. What you do with that, they, they could care less. But initially, remember, you got the, the seller of the house has to put the wheels in motion. So they initially have to, spend the money to put a down payment on an apartment. You know, they have to do that out of their own pocket. They can't wait till they get the 10,000 to then go and do that. <clears throat> because the one thing banks don't allow is for a use and occupancy or a lease back. So banks don't want to see the people who were there before becoming tenants. And they don't, they don't want that. They, they will frown upon that. So they got to kind of put the money out ahead of time and then they get reimbursed from the bank the 10k so they don't really care what you do with the 10k it's kind of like a kind of like a cash for key situation at that point hopefully that answers your question then uh okay next uh secure the listing and collect the documents needed so remember guys aside from aside from getting all the documents you need that we spoke about earlier on you got to get them to sign the listing agreement that's part of the package that you have to send out to the bank so the listing agreement is when I go to a short sale it's already pre-filled I'm putting in six percent because they're not paying the commission the bank's paying the commission. So it's pre-filled. Everything is already filled out to make it as streamlined as possible. I don't know if anyone has been in real estate long enough to experience how uncomfortable it is to fill out a listing agreement in front of someone. It's very uncomfortable. I don't know if maybe it's just me, but I've like kicked myself. Belinda off. said yes. <laughs> oh my God, it's so uncomfortable. I'm like, because then you got to, then you got to kind of like, what are you filling out there? What, what does that mean? Like, no, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. kind of like you got 20 questions, you know? So uh, I, I take it from me, guys. Two better, hour process. Better. Yeah, it could get, I can get ugly. I mean, practice this stuff. If you've never been to a listing appointment, practice this stuff and do it before you go to a listing appointment. <clears throat> In the beginning, I know that we're all very new and very nervous. And I remember my first time getting someone to sign a contract. I literally read every line with them. My broker was with me that day. He's in the corner cracking up. <laughs> and, you know, after I left, he's like, what the hell was that? I was like, I don't know. I thought I did a good job. He's like, he's like, dude, you're not a lawyer. Like, just get them to sign, explain to them one thing on each page and then move on. Like, oh, OK, I didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, you, you, you live and you learn. But it was a very uncomfortable process. And I was doing it with a childhood friend and it was uncomfortable. I could imagine if it was with a, a person that I didn't know or a stranger or someone, it would have been even worse. So, all right. List the property, list the property in the appropriate MLS at fair market value. Make sure to add the following language to your listing, sold as is and subject to bank approval. I'm not sure how it might be in different um, boards and different MLSs, but from my experience in the past, we've always had to disclose that it's being sold as is and being sold subject to bank approval. Because when we list it at fair market value, 
fair market value may be less than what they owe. So if someone is like, oh my God, I'm going to get this home for 300,000, they make an offer for 300,000, then they don't get it. They're like, hey, that was false advertising. Well, not if you put down that it's subject to bank approval, because then you're letting someone know ahead of time, like, look, you can make an offer of 300,000, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's the bank's, it's the bank's decision to, to okay the sale. And they have to know that. Okay. Some people don't even know that. And I'm going to share some tips with you. And I don't know if it's in this list. It's going to help you guys weed out bad buyers, right? Even if you're on the listing end, I'm going to help you guys weed out bad buyers. Uh, Lewis, where do you put that sold as is subject to bank approval in the agent remark or in the public remark? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, <clears throat> we would we would normally put that in the agent section because I okay. believe that, yeah, I believe that putting it in a public description uh, was a little redundant because, you know, on our MLS, if you put it in the in the uh, description and the subject and the agent's description, sometimes it, it shows up twice. Uh, but Joelle used to do a lot of that for me. So I'm not sure if maybe she can answer that better because I didn't do too much of the inputting. Um, Belinda says, because this is recorded, please advise us to go over the contract with our prospects and instructing them to go over it. Uh, the contract, the contract, over the contract. Yeah, so the con the contract. I I'm, when re it I'm referring to the listing agreement because the it was said to just have them sign it. Oh yeah, when I when I mean just have them sign it, they have to know what they're signing. I'm not saying just sign here, sign here, sign here. Explain to them what they're signing. But as far as like going through the details of every single line on the listing agreement, it's not necessary because at the end of the day, what's most important for a seller when they're signing a listing agreement with you is what are they responsible for as far as your commission. So when I pull out the listing agreement, what I tell them is that look, you're not responsible for the closing costs on your on your transaction, which include the attorney's fee, our commission, transfer taxes, any even unpaid sewer, water, and taxes. None of that stuff is going to fall on you unless the bank deems that they're not going to cooperate with you on a sale. And at that point, you can kill the transaction and you don't owe anybody a dime. So you're always in the driver's seat. But what I tell them is like, look, when we do our short sales, the banks pay a 6% commission. That's, that's um, uh, traditionally what we're, what we're given. And when they understand that, they understand, okay, so I'm not on the hook for any of these expenses. They know that with this listing agreement, they're going to be, uh, ensuring that we get paid for our, uh, for our time and for our effort. And we're, it, I always tell them that our interests are in line with theirs because we don't make a dime. We could spend three, six, a year, uh, worth of time working on this and we won't make any money until they're able to sell their house. And then at that point we get paid by the bank. And if it never closes, we never get paid. So I tell them that our interests are mutually in line with each other. And when they understand that, they, they're they like, okay, no problem. You know, so they just under, have them understand that they're not on the hook unless uh, the bank is unwilling to do it. And then at that point, if they can't afford it, then they just kill the transaction. That's usually what I tell them. Um, is that something you do, Belinda? Or how do you, how do you go about that? Uh, that is something pretty much that I do. I, I do for our guard contracts here in Georgia, we do have them itemized on two pages and then the rest of the nine pages are going into full detail. Yeah. And I already go in it with it highlighted mm -hmm. uh, with the things that they really need to pay attention to, but I will mm -hmm. instruct anybody to read through it on their own time. Yeah. Um, and, and that's all I wanted. I didn't Absolutely. want it to seem like we just mm -hmm. put paper in front of people and just like, you know, here, this is what it is. Sign it. Let's get the, let's get the show on the road. Yeah, absolutely. What I think the most important things for someone to realize on a listing agreement are how long you're going to be working together with short sales. I always put the maximum allowed time that you're allowed to take a listing for. And good thing you brought this up, Belinda. Uh, in um, in our old MLS, which is the, the board and uh, the Garden State MLS, uh, our limit to taking a listing was two years. So we used to put down two years. And if anyone ever asked me why two years, excuse me, I would always tell them that this, this is the maximum allowed time that we're allowed to take the listing for and short sales can take two months and they could take two years. I've had short sales that take two years, but if at any point you don't think that I'm representing you in the right capacity, just let me know. I don't hold anyone hostage. I'll release you from your listing. That's always been my approach to that. And no one has ever fought me on it. Uh, what do you, what do you put down Belinda as far as term? My term is uh, usually a year. A year? Okay. Yeah, because we don't have a, a limitation on how long you can hold a listing here in Georgia. 
Okay. Yeah. In Jersey, we had a two year uh, limitation there, but I'm not sure how it is in Florida, but whatever we're allowed to, I would always go with the max. If, if there is no max, I would probably still stick to two years. If there's no max, it doesn't warrant enough time. If you can't get the deal done in two years, it's probably just not meant to be. It's probably meant for you to move on. Yeah. That, and uh, just allowing them to understand that your relationship with them, how you're representing them on a listing agreement, that's important, but you know, you've got a CIS or, or a representation form for that as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Janet is, is also adding that if we have any leases or room rental agreements, they need to be honored. Uh, absolutely. Because if, um, if it's a legal rental, which I mean by legal rental is that it's legal to um, the, the city uh, ordinances or the state. If it's a legal rental and they have a lease, it's got to be honored no matter who buys the property. So that, that goes without saying. If the um, seller is has illegal, e illegal borders um, and room in house, then those people have rights also. But at the same time, like you have to ask these questions when you're taking this listing. If like, what's the situation with the house? Like, do you, is this your family that's living there? If you have any, if you like, if you're walking through the house and you've got some reservations about like, hey, why is there a key locks on these bedrooms? You know, if you guys have ever been to a house where people rent out rooms and they still live there with their family, but maybe they got like a friend of the family or a cousin that rents out this one room, you got to ask what the situation is with that. Because those people, if they're left behind, they're going to be the responsibility of the new buyer. And that can get, you know, it can get really ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis, are you still taking the same uh, listing package with you? Like the CIS, the lead-based oh, yeah. hands? All, okay. that all that stuff goes without saying. So um, okay. in New Jersey, like you were mentioning, we have lead-based paints, we have CISs and other States, you know, have, you have variations of those, but yeah, you still need to come with everything you would normally take a listing with. For Got sure. it. Thank Addi you. Additionally to all this stuff that you have on here. Okay. Sure. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. So number seven, accepting an offer. Okay. So let me uh, click on this. Accepting an offer, make sure to accept an offer that is the highest and best, but also meets the following criteria. And this is these are the tips that I want to talk to you guys about, okay? Buyer must be responsible for all municipal inspections because the seller a lot of times does not want to be responsible for fixing anything the city wants them to fix because they're not benefiting from the sale unless the bank gives them some money. I've gotten, I sometimes I've been able to get the seller to make some repairs, sellers who are very, very like, motivated but most of the time those city repairs or city inspections they fall on the buyer okay uh and some in some states i'm not sure how uh, texas is or georgia or florida um, well florida we don't even do city inspections when we sell a home but if there aren't any then you have nothing to worry about but if they are city inspections you got to make sure that those fall on the buyer okay mm -hmm. uh next the buyer must do a home inspection after attorney review or if you're in a non-attorney state buyer must do the home inspection immediately after the uh, offer has been signed. Why is that? Because there's nothing worse than working on a short sale for three months, six months, a year, just to have the buyers do their home inspection then to find out they don't want the house because it has too many flaws and issues. If you guys have never been in that situation before, do not accept an offer unless it's written in the contract that they're going to do their home inspection immediately after you guys have a solid contract, okay? It'll save you guys so much aggravation, weeds out bad buyers, and makes you look that much better and more skilled to your seller. Make sense? Yes. Good. In Texas, yeah, go for it. the promulgated forms in Texas are different. Um, and that the op we have what's called an option period here. Yes. And though the wording... Um, the wording is such that, because uh, I haven't looked at these for a while. Yeah, I love um, Texas laws, by the way. I'll yeah. do that anything in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, in those ones, the buy you can't require the buyers to do inspections. The buyer's option period does not start until the approval starts. Oh, so, yeah. So you're so in Texas, the um, option day, uh, does not end until the short sale approval is in place? It does not start until the short sale approval is in place. Okay, now is that a uh, is that a, a um, is that an agreement that could be modified if both parties agree to a modification of it? So, for instance, if it's a short sale situation, can you have the buyers write into the contract that they will they are willing to do their home inspection uh, during the option period or as soon as the option period starts? You know, I'm going to ask that question because it's mm -hmm. a promulgated form that it's on. Yeah, because so if it's, it's mutually really agreed question. upon, yeah, I don't. I'm sorry to cut you off. If it's mutually agreed upon. 
I, I don't see how that would be a violation of either one's law of either one's rights. Mm -hmm. So that would be good to 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 know because Texas is a very big state that I, you know, a lot of people are interested in in doing business in. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll work to get you some answers on that. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. Uh, the other thing, buyer must order title after attorney review or in some states, once you have a um, contract or maybe in, in Texas, again, when it comes to the uh, option period, I'm not sure if you're allowed to order title during the option period. Is that something you're allowed oh, to yeah. do? Okay. Oh, yeah. the, the buyer I, I start that right away to make sure that I want to start that right away just to make sure that I've got the person who can actually sell the property. Correct. And there's correct. A, a clear title. Exactly. So that's exactly what we want to do. And the fact that when we're doing a short sale, title is so important because when you do a short sale and the seller tells you that, you know, they've got one mortgage and they've got these credit cards and all that, whenever and you, whenever you meet with them, they tell you a bunch of stuff. And then you'd run title and you find out they have an IRS lien against the house. You find out they have a mm -hmm. second mortgage they forgot about. Like that, these are the things you need to know ahead of time. Like, right. So, and if you want a short sale that's going to be successful, have the buyers run title as soon as you go under contract. Uh, some attorneys that represent buyers, and if the buyers don't have an attorney, you know, that's probably a little easier to, to have them do. But a lot of attorneys are going to kick and scream that they don't want their clients ordering title until they have a short sale approval. Now, this is something that you guys are going to have to prepare for because you really have to go into a, a, a contract with someone who is willing to take on these um, kind of risks as a buyer. Because as a buyer, what's, more, what's, worth, more, what's worth more to you? spending a couple hundred dollars on searches now or spending the next six months waiting for a house that you're not going to get all that lost time lost opportunity increase in home prices increase in interest rates you don't know what, what the future brings or would you rather find out this week if that home mm -hmm. is going to be able to to be done as a short sale right Louis, is this i'm sorry uh uh can i say that to yeah. the buyer's agent to put it in the contract's terms oh yeah that we want them to order the title like right after we go under contract yes you can but unfortunately you can put anything you want into an offer when you make the offer once the attorneys get the contracts they mutilate them a lot of times and your attorney that represents your seller has to be ready willing and able to kill any deal that gets modified afterwards if it doesn't meet the best interest of the seller not your best interest not the agent's best interest but the seller's best interest and the seller's best interest comes when you have a buyer who is willing to do these things ahead of time. So you can facilitate that sale that much better because usually with short sales, correct me if I'm wrong. If anyone's ever done a short sale here, you've got multiple offers, you've got backup offers. And if you do, then that means that if this one doesn't want to do it, then the next buyer may want to do it, you know, and um, as you got to be, sometimes you got to be on, how would I say, disconnect yourself from any one offer because you could have a great relationship with the agent who brought you this buyer, but if that buyer doesn't perform, then it doesn't matter what kind of relationship you have with that agent, that relationship is going to get soured. Your relationship with the seller is going to get soured. You could lose that deal. So really disconnect yourself from a buyer that's not super motivated because it's really going to bring you guys, um, it's really going to leave a bad taste in your mouth from doing short sales. This is why a lot of people fail at doing short sales. It's because they don't weed out bad actors in in the transaction okay so just from experience guys I'm, we've literally done over a thousand short sales and that's no exaggeration joali can tell you that we've literally done over a thousand short sales and mm -hmm. we've seen everything okay all right uh number four home sold as is condition of course obviously that should be in the contract or subject to bank approval that needs to be written into your contract, into, your contract. into additional provisions because if it's not, the bank's going to ask you to have it written in anyway. Okay. So just make sure you put that in there and it protects everybody. And I'm sure if you have an attorney state, the attorney is going to write it into their, into their contracts. And they're also going to also write in a period, a short sale, um, I guess, approval period. Uh, I forget the exact words they use, but it's a mutually agreed upon time frame in which the buyer and the seller have decided that if the short sale doesn't get approved by this date, then either buyer or seller can terminate the contract. Okay. So for instance, we can't just have a contract that goes on into in, in forever. It's, it's not legal. But if we have a contract that says that, okay, well, we want to close by, we want to close 30 days after short sale approval, but then the addendum or maybe the contract um, rider will say that 
either party has the right to cancel the contract after six months if it's not approved or three months, whatever the case is, the longer the better for you. If you can get them to do six months, that's better. I've, I've noticed that majority of short sales do get done within six months, but it could take longer, you know, and that's unfortunate. But hopefully, if anything does come out of a, a deal that dies on you, if I spend six months and that buyer walks, at least by that time, I've got an idea of what the bank's going to actually accept because we've probably gotten as far along where we've gotten an approval letter. And if you get an approval letter, then you know you can go back on the market and say the short sale has previously been approved at X amount. And then if you um, if you get another buyer, usually it goes quicker on a second time around because the underwriters usually know the file and it goes a little bit faster. So next. Uh, this is what you asked before. Uh, Sarah, which is the appraisal or the BPO? Yeah, the appraisal. Yeah. So the bank sends out an appraiser to value the home because they're not just going to take your word for it as an agent. Believe it or not, I remember when short sales first came around, the banks used to ask us for BPOs for the properties that we were submitting uh, offers on. If that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know what is. But sooner or later, they wised up and he started asking for appraisals, a full-blown at first, there were BPOs that they used to be done by other uh, agents, and then they, they um, started to spring for appraisers. And then at one point or another, they did two appraisals. And so it, it, it really got, it, it was all over the board. So make sure to be present for the inspection, right? On that day that the shorts are, uh, the bank's going to be doing the, um, the appraisal, make sure to be there. Uh, why you want to be there is because, uh, hold on a second, be present, especially when you're done. Oh yeah. So like I was saying, so sometimes they do both. They do an appraisal and a BPO. So if they do an appraisal and a BPO, a BPO is done usually by an agent, appraisal is done by an appraiser. Try to get them done both on the same day because it'll save you time, you know, just some strategic planning. Uh, and what you want to have with you when they do the appraisal and the BPO is you want to have with you, where is it? Um, send package. Okay. Go all over the place. What is a BPO? Uh, broker's price opinion. Oh. Okay, so broker's price opinion. Um, someone asked me about BPOs the other day. Oh, is it a good idea to do BPOs? I was like, not unless you like to, <laughs> not unless you like change. <laughs> not, 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 I've never really had, um, I mean, some people are wired differently, but I've never enjoyed a BPO. Um, I remember um, at one point I used to work for an REO broker where they focused just on real estate owned properties from banks. And the guy was a machine. Like he would pump out BPO after BPO after BPO after BPO. And I'm like, how does this guy even find the time? Because they're very time consuming. And come to find out the only thing he did was the field work. He would go out and take pictures. And then he had people in the Philippines pumping out the BPOs for him. <laughs> so <laughs> no one likes doing BPOs. So I, 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 even that guy who was a straight robot, not even him. Okay, so some of the tips that I have for you for this, uh, for the BPO, the appraisal, uh, other than having them both be done on the same day, make sure that you bring with you the following, uh, a copy of the offer, okay? You can bring a copy of the offer with you because a lot of times they ask you for it anyway. Comps, which help your, your case. So for instance, if there's three comps that recently sold in the neighborhood that are what you use to bring up the fair market value, bring those with you. Because if you can make the agent's life easier, and if you can make the appraiser's life easier, believe me, they will, a lot of times, they will, they'll, they'll work with you on that. A uh, home inspection report, if you feel like the home has flaws and you're trying to bring it down to a certain price, you can give them that. You can give them uh, an opinion letter from the agent. Believe it or not, you can give them an opinion letter on your letterhead and everything with your name and signed on why you feel like this home is worth what it is an appraisal if there is one available. So if there's already been an appraisal done on the property and the buyer allows you to use that appraisal because it's their, it's their, um, it's their uh, property. And the, I'm, I'm talking about the appraisal itself is their property because they pay for it. If they give you the right to bring it with you, then you can also give that to the prior appraiser or, or the BPO agent if, it, if it's the number that you guys are looking for. None of that stuff is illegal. The only thing that's illegal is trying to coerce the appraiser or the BPO agent to bring in a number that is like way out of whack that you're trying to just like scheme the bank on. But if you've got everything that's above board and these are documents that they request anyway, you can you can have them. If they don't, I've I've gone there sometimes and they're like, I don't need them. 
I don't need any of that. Okay, no problem. But at least you're prepared if they do ask you for any of that. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do disputes, believe it or not, if you ever have to dispute a price on an appraisal for a short sale, which you can do, I actually made a video on it. You guys can check out on my channel. Um, when you do a dispute, they actually ask you for all the things that I just mentioned. Okay, so the appraiser actually looks at these things if you ever have to dispute their value. All right, number 10, uh, approval is issued. Okay, so when you get your short sale approval, everyone uh, celebrates, it's a good day when you get a short sale approved. Uh, when you get a short sale approved, you wanna read through the terms very carefully because there have been times when short sale banks have not given a um, release for the deficiency. So what does that mean? Uh, usually when a short sale is approved, the seller is um, forgiven for any shortfalls that may arise from the short sale. So let's just say that they sold it for 300 and they owed four. That 100,000 usually goes away and they're forgiven for it, depending on the type of loan they took out or depending on the situation. Um, and the only downfall to, not really so much, so much as a downfall, but the only caveat to that is that they're still responsible to file that $100,000 as a gain on their tax returns. But there is an IRS code that allows a seller to not have to pay any tax on that law, on that gain up to a million dollars on a primary residence. But since you and I are not CPAs or tax professionals, we never want to tell our clients that they're going to get that automatic. That's not an, a thing that we're, we should ever engage in a conversation with we can point them to the tax code in which it says that and we can also tell them that when they do get that 1099 because they're going to get a 1099 in the mail after the after they close that year and they're going to call you and they're going to be like what the hell is this hundred thousand dollar 1099 you've never told me about this you have to explain to them you're going to get this 1099 and from our previous experiences with previous sellers they filed this on their tax return and there's a code, uh, there's an IRS statute code that, that protects them up to a million dollars on primary residences. So talk to your CPA about this and talk to your accountant about this and how you'll handle the shortfall that you're going to receive. Okay. So that's something you guys have to be very, very um, open with with them because you don't want any surprises. Someone Louis, gonna... do you know what that tax code is? Oh yeah, I can give you that. I just simply Google it. I'll show you guys right now. It's called... Hold on, let me minimize this. Okay. Mortgage. Debt cancellation. Okay. Uh, here we go. This is this was um hasn't been updated for a while. But you can find it right here. I'll I'll post it in the. Okay, thank you. It's called the Mortgage Forgiveness Debt Relief Act of 2007. Generally allows taxpayers to exclude income from discharge of debt on their prior on their principal residence. Uh, debt reduced through mortgage restructuring as well as mortgage debt forgiveness in connection with the foreclosure uh, qualify for this relief. So basically you could do a short sale. You could do a uh, deed in lieu, which means you give the house back to the bank. You can do a, uh, you can get foreclosed on any of those things and whatever the loss was to the bank, it qualifies under this debt cancellation. Okay. Thank you. No Thank worries. you. Good question though. Yeah, I'll post it in here. Okay. Uh, the, the, oh yeah. So make sure you read the, the um, short sale approval letter. And in the short sale approval letter, you're going to see a couple of things that you got to take notice of. They're going to have um, expenses that are, have been approved. So you got to go through all those expenses to make sure they're in line with what you submitted to the bank. Because when you submit an offer to the bank, you have to accompany it with a closing disclosure or a HUD one. So some of us, never in their life thought they did they would be preparing a hud one or a closing disclosure on their own it looks like a foreign language and i when i first did this a few times i was completely lost i had to call my uh, attorney and be like hey i just filled out this hud one can you look at it real quick for me and see if i made any mistakes i would call the paralegal like 
every couple of hours and she's like, ha ha ha, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. This doesn't make any sense. So like I learned how to prepare a HUD one through just trial and error. And then I taught it to many other people after that. And they're like, oh, this isn't that hard. This is pretty simple. I've literally taught every processor we ever had. I've taught other agents how to do it. It's not the hardest thing in the world, but in order for a bank to look at your offer, it has to be accompanied with a HUD one or a CD. And if you do not want to learn how to do that, then just get the a title company or the attorney to prepare it for you and send it in. Because once you get that approval letter, it's going to have approved expenses. And you just want to make sure that your approved expenses are in line with what you were expecting on your HUD one, because you, you, you never want to, you, you never want to go to a closing and find out that the bank's not paying for the attorney or the bank's not paying for the title or, you know, because that, or, or maybe the bank cut you down on commission and you didn't even have the opportunity to fight it when you had a chance. So you want to make sure you check that out. And you also want to check out how much time they're giving you. It could be all over the board. Uh, and sometimes the short sale approval letter is not even a short sale approval letter. It's what's called a um, approval to participate, which means that, okay, we've looked at the property, we've looked at the offer, and we've looked at everything. And we approve you to participate in the short sale program, which means that we want you to put it on the MLS now, and we want you to market it at this price, and then we'll look at offers in two weeks you know, or something like that. So you may actually lose that buyer that you had because the bank is, is telling you to, you've got an offer, you got to accept this to participate. Sometimes I've seen it where you can uh, circumvent that and you can be like, look, we already have a buyer. It meets all your criteria. Can we just review this buyer and then go with it? But if your approval to participate is higher than your offer, and your buyer is unwilling to bring their offer up to that price, then you have to put it back on the market at that price. And they approve you to participate in the program. And they're basically telling you this is a pre-approved short sale. So we're going to approve it as long as you get us an offer of 300000 or something. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, mortgage and the appraisal. Uh, so when the buyers buy a home, you know that they're going to get a mortgage done most of the time. And you want to make sure that the buyer's lender schedules the appraisal for the loan as soon as possible and clears all the conditions um, because you don't want to not meet your deadline on short sales because, like I said, they take a lot of work and a lot of time. And the last thing you want to do is not meet your deadline because the buyer dragged their feet on their mortgage approval. OK, so you want to be on top of those things. Uh, I'm going to jump into questions in just a minute, guys, because we're, we're, um, we're getting to the, uh, to the end almost. I just want to be able to complete this at least today. Uh, additional deposits. So in uh, most transactions, there's a first deposit and a second deposit. So confirm that you've gotten a second deposit, either if the uh, title company is going to hold it or the attorney is going to hold it, make sure that second deposit gets collected. Okay. Next, we want to get to the mortgage commitment. So you want to uh, get, um, get the mortgage commitment or approved by the buyer's lender as soon as possible. And if there's any delays, uh, see if the extension, you can get for, go for an extension ahead of time. So for instance, if, um, if I'm scheduled to close next week and we just got the, the buyer's commitment on their mortgage today and the commitment is asking for some outlandish things that you're like, oh my God, this is going to take some time. You want to ask for that extension now because the last thing you want to do is ask for an extension the day before the closing because the, sell, the, the, um, the underwriter, the short sale negotiator, whoever for the bank, they're going to be like, dude, you could have told me this a few days ahead of time. Like, I don't appreciate being put, you know, my back against the wall with telling me you need an extension that they because they get graded too, believe it or not. Short sale negotiators and underwriters at banks, they have a score too. And if they don't close a certain amount of transactions every month, their expectations or their, their quotas, they also don't look good. So you want to make sure that you're always very, very communicative with the uh, people from the bank. That's how you build good rapport. Uh, Next, uh, if you, your city requires home uh, city inspections, make sure those get done ASAP because that could hold you up as well. Homeowners insurance, this is something that a buyer could shop around for even way ahead of the uh, closing time. Um, closing date reminder, uh, the closing date is a contract, uh, is a target date and is not set in stone. Many things can postpone the closing. Submit a commission bill for, okay. Yeah, so um, really with this, what it is a closing date reminder is keeping everybody on the same page because in real estate, you guys know there's so many different parties that can hold up the closing. Most of the time, attorneys and title companies, you want to make sure that you keep everybody on the ball. And what, I, what I'd what i like to do is usually we set out 
a two week reminder. We set out a one week reminder and we wanna make sure that our commission statements get sent out um, ahead of time because there literally was a closing in which we didn't get paid commission because we didn't give them our uh, our commission uh, statement or commission bill or something or something happened with the commission bill. And then the, 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 the title company closed the transaction. We got paid zero commission and a uh, very unfortunate event, but you know, it, it is what it is. We, you know, we learn with our mistakes. So make sure that those things happen because once the bank has their money, you can't then say that a bank, Oh, we messed up. We need to, uh, we need you to send us back $6,000 for commission. They're going to be like, Oh no, sorry, we're good. So there's no motivation for them to send back commission afterwards. Uh, utilities when closing date is has been set for the buyer called necess necessary utilities a lot of people forget to do this but the last thing you want to do is um forget to call utilities or get a final water reading because that can also give the buyers and sellers a bad experience with the transaction and hold up your closing too uh get the preliminary hud approved by a short sale lender okay this is your final step in getting the short sale approved and closed just because the bank has given you a short sale approval letter doesn't mean that, okay, it's all downhill and it's nothing to worry about. You could literally have your short sale, um, how would I call it, disapproved or canceled if you send in a HUD-1 that the bank is going to net a different amount than what you initially told them they were going to net. So initially, if you told them from a $300,000 offer, they were going to net two eighty. dollars and at the closing, when you have the actual HUD-1 or closing disclosure, and it says they're going to net 275, they're not going to approve that. So you have to make sure that their net is the same net that they were going to, that they approved on their short sale approval or that you sent in initially. You want to make sure those match up and you want to make sure that the approved expenses match up. So if the attorney was going to get paid 2,500, well, it can't be 2,700 just because there's an extra $200 floating around. They won't approve that. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that the seller is walking away with zero dollars and the only money they're getting is from the bank if they are if the bank is giving them a credit okay because that also will will not work out um you want to make sure everything is is exactly the way you presented it uh final walkthrough i don't have to explain to you guys how important this is doing a final walkthrough especially on short sales very important because you want to make sure that they're fully moved out of this house you want to make sure that they didn't blow up the house you know before they moved out because they hate the bank you know, you know crazier things have happened uh, getting paid, attend the closing, make sure you get a commission check. If you're not there, make sure you're in communication with the bank. Uh, get a copy of the HUD-1, get a copy of the uh, of the of the check, you know, anything you may need, because you do need to send those documents to the short sale bank, unless the title company is going to do it for you. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And then ask for a review. I mean, that's really at the end of the day, you 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 did something that most agents will never do. If you did, if you did a really good job, those sellers will those sellers will literally refer you for life because you have helped them tremendously. Helping somebody get up under a home that's going into foreclosure is, is, a, is a really good feeling for that seller. So if you're ever going to get a great review or a raving review, it's going to be from a short sale seller. So yeah, so that's pretty much it for the workflow. Uh, I will share this with you guys. I'll give you guys this as I'm here on the, on the chat. And uh, we've got some questions. So we're going to jump into that real quick and then we'll go. All right, let me see if we have some questions here. Da, 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 da. Uh, some people had to, had to run. Okay. Um, yeah, the only thing we've got as far as a question here, Janet uh, says she emailed me a short sale addendum and um, she's not seeing the option period mentioned in there. So um, it may be okay. It might be okay. I think she's implying that it may be okay for us to be able to negotiate that between buyer and seller if we want certain things done ahead of time. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's what she might be referring to. But now let me just open up the room for any questions. I know we're way over time, but I think this one was a really informative one where you guys can take away some actual uh, action steps on doing short sales. So any questions? Yeah, Luis, sure. real quick. Um, with... Um... It sounds like a, a quite a process, a tedious process, and yes. um, uh, and, and and an impossible task for one to do it by themselves. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, so maybe one cell 
the short sell, yes. But now when you have two or three, mm -hmm. uh, do you recommend team effort? And, and if yes, how would that look like for people mm -hmm. like us who um, are just doing our own thing? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it, it may look like a lot of work, but let me see if I can um, pull something up real quick. I want to show you something. I mean, for, yeah, for, like I'm on my own. I'm basically, you know, doing, uh, you know, this business by myself. Um, so that's what I meant by, you know, working as a team and yeah. how would that look like uh, when I don't belong to any team? Okay. So let me just answer this. If you were to, um, if you were to put a workflow together of everything you did when you worked with a buyer or when you worked with a seller traditionally, that list is going to be probably, I would say 75% as long as the short sale one was. The short sale one's a little bit more intensive. So with anything you do in real estate, the quicker you can get to delegation, the better you're going to do. So if, um, if you're thinking about doing short sales or, or even just doing more real estate in general, the first thing you want to do is get rid of all the the clerical work, get rid of all the things that don't move your needle and don't bring you more business. So for instance, with us, we've done everything we've done right now. We've got it down to a science where we just have one short sale processor who handles all our short sales. All we do is provide her with the paperwork and then she starts the process. And if she needs more paperwork, she communicates directly with the, um, the sellers to collect more paperwork. And if the sellers don't communicate with her, then we get involved. Okay. So that's pretty much at the end of the day, what you want to strive for with anything with, even if you're just doing luxury listings or first time home buyers, you want to get to the point where your only highest and best use is getting more business and everything else gets pushed off to someone else. So what we did at one point was when short sales were at their peak, we had an assembly line. The agents would go out and get short sales. We'd hand them off to, to girls like Joelle. They would run. They would run with them. We actually had someone who was before Joelle. We had what was called an opener who prepared the file. Then Joelle or an agent, another agent like Joelle, would start from day one to close. And then at close, we would have a closer who then closed our transaction. So that was like a whole stream, like a whole assembly line that we put together. And we were pumping out hundreds of short sales uh, a, a year. But you don't need all that. You just need one competent person who knows how, how to do this work, who knows his job. And then you as an individual agent, or maybe as a, as a, maybe a duo or like a small team, you guys can just use that one short sale processor and get it done. Like, it's not that hard. You just need someone who's capable of doing the work. The pay scale that you pay that person to hire. So Yeah. So the pay scale, when we ran it as a team, I would, um, I would get a, even though I was an owner, I, I, I believe I would get a, how much was it? I used to pay a 20% referral. Joely, do you remember what I used to pay? I think I used to pay like a 20% referral fee on every short sale I would do. And I would that would go towards funding the, the team. So every I think every agent would pay a 20% referral fee and fund the operation. And then they would keep their... So for instance, if an agent was on a 70-30 split, they would end up getting a 50 split. And then the, the short sale team would do all the work, which was great because you only pay if you close. If you don't close, you've got a free staff working for you uh with uh when you get where you when you're going to hire someone that's going to be your admin to do this stuff with you um you can get someone who's a va i've, I've heard of people paying vas three to four dollars as little as three or four dollars overseas i pay my my va uh she's overseas as well i pay her eight dollars because i want her to be overcompensated for the market she's in so that way she's motivated to work and then on top of that, I give her a closing bonus every time we close a transaction. So she's doing very well for herself. She's been with us for how long now, Joely? Five, six years? Probably maybe even longer than that. Yeah. So you don't have to, you don't have to like break the bank, guys. Like how did you find someone overseas, Lewis? Uh, I went on Upwork and I found uh, someone on Upwork. There's a lot of different sites you can use, like um onlinejobs.ph. That's uh, one that some people have used that's a little bit cheaper than um than um, Upwork, but Upwork is a good place to use because they're they're highly trusted. You can really, you know, you you pay through them. Uh, on other sites, you might have to pay directly through PayPal or something like that. So 
I recommend looking at Upwork. That might be a big game changer for you guys. So you mentioned 20%. You, you said well, I gave a 20% referral fee and that took care of all the staff. Yeah, so like we, I think we had, if I'm not mistaken, I think we had like three short sale processors, one opener and one closer. So every agent that was closing a transaction was giving out 20% to fund that, that, that operation. And we would have to pay those girls because I was, I was a part owner. We would have to pay those girls their salaries. So as owners, we had salaries to cover. So whenever somebody would close a transaction, those extra commissions that we would collect would basically reimburse us and help us cover that expense of having a whole team. But you don't need that. That's overkill. Would you train your um, short sale processor? Uh, well, or our closer, yeah. So our closer was initially trained by myself and my partner, and then mm -hmm. she would train the processors. But my the girl that I have now, Joely and I trained her from day one, and she is okay. she's like a robot. Okay. You guys have some of you might have dealt with her before. Her name is Jennifer. She's an absolute savage. Yes, I think they like two, two or three. Yeah, the two or three uh, shows or whatever. She's great and on top of everything. Uh, yeah, she's calling the band, follow up. Like, save you like tons of time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't wait for short sales to start pumping around again because it's they're very lucrative, guys. Like, I know a lot of you think like, oh, it's so much work, it's so much time. But if if you're looking to have a high chance of double ending deals, if you're looking for an opportunity to buy some distressed properties like short sales like that that really is like a really good opportunity for you guys to learn that process because there's no competition you're it's a lot of times it's one-on-one -on -one, you're negotiating with the bank uh you know you could really get a lot of opportunity that way even if it's not your short sale if you see a short sale that's marketed on the, on the mls you know a lot of times you may um you may think like oh that's really not worth the time but i'm telling you it's, you you play enough of them you'll get you'll get a good deal you know it's um we're not there yet. I feel like we still have some time to have the bar and the market soften up a little more. But when we do get there, you guys will be very happy to, to have a, Lewis, a hand in Lewis, this. I could just throw a, an idea in the hat for a future topic. I know you are, you're probably searching for uh, all topics for these uh, sessions, but yeah. I feel like I'm at a place where I need to um, get help, hire staff, administration, mm -hmm. what you're referring mm -hmm. to. But I really yeah. don't know how. And mm -hmm. if you wanted to go through, uh, this was my first year and why you may, that would help me a lot to just know how, how do I concentrate on things that move my needle as you just yeah. put it. So I, I feel like, okay, I get, I get a, a lead, I rise it to the top, we get to closing, boom, I start over and then you're just riding a one horse mm -hmm. roller coaster. So I'd yeah. like to do more, but I don't know how. So yeah. just think about that and. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think um, next week, if you guys, well, I don't know if next week is Christmas or what it is. It's the day after Christmas. Day after Christmas. Yeah, day after Christmas. Yeah. So um, do you guys want to take next Monday off and regroup on the second of the year? Yep, I do. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's do that. We'll regroup on the second of the year. So what we'll do on the second of the year is we're going to start with what's called a, 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 a to don't list. A to, don't, a to don't list is basically the opposite of a to do list, which means that everything you do that you shouldn't be doing. And those are the things you give to the VA or to your admin. Okay. So we'll start with that. And uh, for everyone, it's going to be different because everyone is good at different things. Everyone's bad at different things. And there's going to be um, a merge or a marriage in between things that you don't like doing and things that don't make you money. And if you can find those things that are you don't like doing and don't make you money, those are the number one things you give away. Okay. So we'll, we'll cover that on the 2nd of January. That's great. Um, Thank you. Can I no just... Problem. Add real quick. Yes, after please, Melinda. Our week last after our talk Monday, um, I got a stack of papers here, and it intrigued me to see what was happening. So in Georgia, we have a site called um, Public Notice, Georgia Public Notice, where all the newspapers, uh, things that were going up for sale. Yeah. And in a county that I service, I pulled seventy-five homes that are being sold on a courthouse steps in one county on the third wow. of january so nice. my time is here and i feel like I, i'm getting ready to play catch up or yeah. to even figure out how to catch these people before they're coming in um it's homes that i would have never thought 
that would be foreclosed mm -hmm. on. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm talking about homes, guys, 500,000 and up. And these are not homes that were purchased in 2020 or 2021. They were purchased in 2015. And why are they going belly up? I would love to know. But I did um, do Christmas cards and I have little scripture sayings in there, you know, words of encouragement, letting them know I've been where you are just to see if I can, you know, just start to get out to them, see what their next steps is and great idea. <clears throat> what That's to a great do. Idea. Uh, some of them are listed for February closure. So I'm hoping that I can help some of those that have a February date up mm -hmm. there, but foreclosures are here. The only thing you want to do with those, Belinda, if you send those letters out, I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. What's uh, do you, you want to be careful with those because some of those may end up being listed unless you're going to go through the trouble of excluding the ones that are listed. But what I, what I've seen people do in the past is um, if you're going to do like a blast mail out like that, just include in there um, like a, it doesn't have to be big. It could be some more small. Um, if your home is listed with another brokers, this would not uh, constitute as a solicitation. Yeah, I've combed through that already. Um, okay. I went through both MLSs and these uh, these seventy five that I have in hand are not were not listed. I okay, don't good. know why they flew under the radar, or why they weren't able to talk to anybody or get help, but um, they they're pretty homes. Great idea. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that idea that you did with the uh, oddball po uh, postcards, and now we have a reason because it's Christmas. You can go ahead and send you know, more, more cards out like that to people that are in foreclosure. Great. That's a great idea. I'm actually going to try that in my area just to give it a test run and I'll let you get, let know how, how it went down. Yeah, no, it's real quick. Yeah. Yeah. A question. Um, yes. There is foreclosure and yeah. there is short sale. Yes. Now, Belinda, you talked about foreclosure. Now, do you convert foreclosure into sh short sale? Because those are two different things. I'm they, sorry. They I'm <laughs> Yeah, no, they are two different things. Um, and like Lewis said, I can't convert them to a short sale unless they are um, underwater, if they owe more than what the house is worth, correct? That's correct, exactly. Yeah. I, I, other than that, it would just be a motivated seller. Right. So for those that I have that are, the sales aren't until February, I'm going to, you know, I send out the card actually today. I'm going to go to the post office today. But I'm also going to do a drive-by this week and ring a doorbell or two, mm -hmm. and <laughs> and great. see if they, you know, if they're willing to talk. Good for you. Yeah, that's really good. Awesome. Did she answer your question, John? Yeah. Okay. Thank good. you. Yeah, uh, guys, I appreciate all of you for being here on this call today. I know we went way over. Uh, next, obviously, next week is Christmas, so I wish everyone, you know, happy. Christmas, Merry Christmas. Hopefully you guys get Thank everything you. you've ever asked for, get some time to rest, relax. But I also want you to remember that this time of year, your competition is relaxing and they're overly doing it. So I want you guys to also make time to really kind of think and take time to sharpen your swords about what you want to do next year and how you can accomplish those goals that much easier next year by doing the things that are not easy. So if you want an easier time in business, you have to really put in the work initially really kind of sacrifice yourself and your ego and whatever it is that you you know is in your way because next year is your year guys 2023 is the year to really shine even though the economy may not be on our side per se that's when we have the opportunity to really really outdo ourselves because competition is going to be going away agreed yeah agreed thank you, Louis. Awesome. no thank, thank you, guys. you Louis. merry Absolutely. christmas Louis. Merry, merry christmas, christmas. Merry merry christmas. christmas everyone. Yeah, let's just go ahead and close out with uh, our prayer today. So, Father God, we thank you for allowing us one more day, Father, to be here together and learn from our experiences. Father, we ask you to allow us to take this information that we got today and be able to implement it in the future, Father, so we can give you all of the credit, Father, and it's for your kingdom and your glory, and allow us to protect our families and uh, provide for them, Father, with the information we were given today. Father, there's people out there who are desperately going to need professionals such as us, and we ask you to put us in there in their past, Father, to um, glorify you, Father, and for your, your name to be the one that's given all the credit. And Father, we ask you to keep us healthy and also give us the opportunity to spend these last couple of weeks and this year that you've given us to be able to just think about what it is we're going to do next and know that you're the perfect partner, Father, and everything we do is because of, of, your, of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you. Have a great day. Merry Christmas. Merry everybody. Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.